Hey friends, Andy here, helping you build a career you love. Today we're gonna talk about job interviewing. Primarily, one of the biggest mistakes job candidates make in an interview. It is, without question, the number one runaway issue that costs you job offers and pay. So get in, settle in, get comfortable. I've got a what I think is a pretty fun show today. I'm going to help you think this through. I'm going to help you overcome it and maybe even turn it turn it into a, a huge positive for you. So get in. I want to say a quick hello, then let's dive right in because we got a lot to cover. Nora, what's up? Johnny Stevens, how you been? Adam Stark, Ramon, Steve, Andy, Michelle, baby girl, what's up? And everybody else, great to have you. We are going to do a Q&A after, put some question marks in front of your questions so I can find them after the show and let me know where you're watching from. And if you are in any of my programs, please make sure and use your hashtag so I can cheer you on and I know what assets you have at your, at your disposal in the event I need to give you some instruction. Okay, this is a big deal. In the coaching sessions that I do every day, I do somewhere between... Oh, I would say probably right now I'm running at about a dozen to 18 of these coaching sessions a week. So I'm talking to a lot of you. This issue, when I am doing interview coaching, is without question the biggest challenge that I see job seekers facing. And it has a lot to do with the way they articulate themselves and they respond to interview questions. And there is a huge difference between what happened in your life and how you're using it to try to sell yourself versus what's the story I need to tell with the information I'm talking about reality, but an interpretation of reality that sells you best. So we're going to run through that. I'm going to I'm, I'm always looking for different ways to try to make the messages register for you, different ways to unlock you so that you get it, meaning you understand what the formula for success is. So I'm really looking forward to this, and let's get, let's get running. Now, of those, of those people that I've been telling you that I've been coaching, whether they're individual coaching clients of mine or members of my job search coaching program, there was this woman named Mina, and Mina is an executive assistant. She actually is just resigning uh, from being an executive assistant at one of the big consultancies. She has a number of different executives that she supports. She's a young lady, uh, but but pretty strong in what she's she's doing. She's organized. She's articulate. Uh, but I think was really struggling. And I was so pleased over the weekend to get this message from her. And this. This, what she is saying in this email is what we're going to be talking about today. She said, hi, Andy and Kara, I got the job offer. I was thrilled to see this. After my interview with the hiring manager on Tuesday, March 12th that Andy helped me for, so I prepared her mid, mid, early to mid-March for these last rounds of, of interviews that she was going through with this particular company, I was scheduled for the final interview with the HR business partner and the CEO's EA on Monday, March 18th, and then I got the job offer the next day. It increased my total cash compensation 40% compared to what I currently earn I start in two weeks. Thank you so much for the help. I went through a lot of interviews with no luck until I had my one-to-one -one session with you, Andy, but since then, I got multiple jobs job offers right away. It was one of my best investments in my life. Can't thank you enough. Good luck with the zebra code, Mina. And exactly what Mina and I worked on, I'm going to share that with you today. And, and this is what I work on with most people when they, when they are, when they're going into interview uh, coaching with me. And a big, a big part of what, what hurts your ability to understand how you can articulate yourself most effectively to sell yourself most effectively to whomever is interviewing you is I always, you know, that expression, let's start with the end in mind. And I, in, in many cases, I do like that. In some cases, I don't like that. But in this particular case, I do like that. And the one thing that I want to really stress for you is that as a, as a job seeker, your goal is to help the employer understand how you're going to impact their business. They have goals. They want you to solve them. You have goals. If, we're, if you're here paying attention to me in this particular lesson, you have a job searching goal or you maybe want to find your dream job or maybe you just like hearing me talk, but let's assume it's the former. And 
for me to show you, look, I just helped Mina. That was an outcome. It was a goal. She had a goal and she was struggling. She had problems. She had interviewing problems and she couldn't get over the goal line. I helped her solve it. That's an outcome. You have that goal. That's what I want to focus on with you. And I could spend a lot of time explaining all the ins and outs and whys and wherefores of every single thing that goes into that. But more than anything, you want to know as quickly as possible, how am I going to help you achieve your outcome? Today, we're going to talk about formulas we're going to use to help you overcome interviewing challenges. But ultimately, when you're in an interview and you're talking to the interviewers, you want to help them understand how they're going to achieve their goals. They have problems in achieving their goals. They might have unique problems, but there's a finite number of problems that they have. And you, as a job candidate, want to show them how you're actually going to achieve their goals. But what a lot of people do is they want to talk about their skills. They want to talk about justifying why they're worth a dollar per hour that they think they're worth, right? I have skills and I can help you because I have these skills and you should pay me $70,000. I want you to stop thinking in those terms and I want you to start thinking like a business owner, right? First order a business. Let's get your mind on what your end goal is in an interview, is to focus on the employer's goals, not how much you want to earn, earn per hour, not what your skills are worth to you, right? but how you're going to truly impact the business. That's the first thing that you have to get, that you have to get in order. And when you are talking to somebody who is going to, who is going to want to want to want to make sure they understand that is whenever you're speaking to somebody it's really about changing their feelings it's really about getting them to focus on how you're going to impact them but they're not going to remember what you said they're going to remember the way that you that you made them feel and a lot of you in the way it, and I'm speaking from the people that I coach every week and even the questions that I get asked at these shows a lot of you are so focused on explaining the details of some anticipated interview questions like tell me about a strength and tell me about a weakness and tell me how you overcame a problem and all this other nonsense that you're trying to you're trying to figure out how to tell a story based on the details and what you've been through in your life. And I don't want you to focus on any, that anymore. It's, it's really what I want you to focus on when you prepare and you, and you then execute the way you tell stories is I want you to focus on the feelings, the feelings you want them to have and not, not, not well, you're going to use some details, but I don't want you to start with the details of packaging a story. I want you to think in terms of if I was them and I had these goals, what, what is it that I would want to feel about me that makes me makes them feel good that I'm the person that they want to hire? And I told you in the interview intervention book, in the epigraph on page 19, for those of you that have the book memorized like I do, right? It's they won't forget how you make them feel and they'll use two adjectives to remember it, right? Kind of thing, right? She was tall with short hair. He was energetic and organized. He really knew his stuff, right? Those kinds of things. It's That's what they're, they're planting in their minds. But most job candidates are not paying attention to that and understanding that that's ultimately what they, what they need to move. So I want you to be thinking about what feelings do I want them to have and where might... Where might you discover those feelings? Well, if you know what their goals are, that's great, and you can anticipate those. But a lot of times, the job description will even tell you. We're looking for energetic. We're looking for highly communicative, somebody who can influence, somebody who's organized, somebody who's motivated, somebody who's got good customer service skills, service skills, right? Somebody will go the extra mile. Those kinds of things, are they're littered in those job descriptions, but you can also anticipate them because you generally know what a great employee is like, right? So, so I, want you, I want you to be thinking about that. And I always think about, you know, when I look at like employees in a, in a, in a job interview or in a, in, just in a, in a corporation, there's basically, there's basically trucks and there's trailers, right? There's the people that, that can move the needle and then there's people that you're tugging along. And you all, you all can be trucks, right? You, you can be trucks. And, and how do we recognize who the trucks are, who the ones that are, that are pulling everybody through the company? Those are the people that are contributing to the great eight accomplishments that I almost tell you about every week, right? The great eight goals that all employers have that you all focus on at least one of those 
those grade eight, right? It's generating revenue. It's increasing market awareness. It's attracting customers. It's servicing customers to make them happy. It's also helping your companies position them for growth, right? Corporate positioning or risk management. There's also employee happiness. There's cost reduction. And then there's process efficiency. The trucks, right, are the ones that can move the needles on that. And when you think about, when you also think about the end state in mind, if you were to interview with me, in one way, shape, or form, I, I probably could conduct an interview with only two questions to know exactly whether, in, within one conversation, whether I was going to want to hire you or not. I'm not kidding here. And so I probably have never articulated this to you this way, but I was trying to think of another way to explain this. If you're going to interview with me, no matter who you are, let's have some fun with this, no matter who you are, the first question I'm going to ask you is, how much money do you want to make? Let's just get this out of the way. How much money do you want to make? All right, so any of you, go in the, go in the chat here. Tell me, how much money would you like to make? That's my first question. And, and the other thing that I, want to, that, I want to, that I want to say to you here is, it, it's, not just about, it's not just about how much money you want to make. Right, so put you can answer me. So, so one way to answer that is give me a number. Just give me a number. I didn't ask you what your expected salary was. I didn't ask you uh, how much money do you currently earn. I don't even care about that. That's irrelevant to me. How much money do you want to make? Paula wants to make one hundred thirty-five thousand. Brian wants to make one hundred fifty thousand. I love it. One hundred fifty thousand. Brian, you're hired. Deborah, two twenty. You're hired. Chronically amused, one ninety to two ten. Jennifer Garrity, one twenty. I love it. Mohit, four hundred. Nadine, two sixty. I love it. All six figures and climbing. Right? Okay. Wait. Hold on. I'm not even being funny here. This is your interview with me. How much money would you like to make? I'm happy to pay you. One way to one way to approach this is give me a number, just like you all are. David Schwartz, four twenty six. Give me a number. Then I'm going to say to you. You have the next 60 minutes to use however you want to explain to me what that looks like. Meaning, meaning, why would I pay you that? Okay? So, now, one way to one way to approach this is just give me the number and then and then and then justify it. You have 60 minutes. You can ask me questions, you can tell me stuff, you can make a presentation. I don't really care how you do it. The other option is, Andy, I'm not sure yet. What is it that you want me to accomplish? Tell me what your goals are, what your problems are, how fast you want it, how many of them you want, and so on, for what cost or whatever, and I'll help you understand how I would approach it and the value I can contribute, and then we can determine a number. That's another way, and I'm okay with either way. But what should be shooting through your mind as you walk into interview number one is, what does Andy want? Andy wants, let's just say, let's pick a part of the Mile Walk Academy business that I could always use help with. I'd love to have more leads, right? Whether that's more eyeballs on me every Thursday, there's 186 of you right now. I'd love to have 1,860 just because I want to help more people, right? There's, there's people in my paying programs. I'd like to have more of those, right? So, okay, if, if you're going to tell me that you're going to increase my leads by so much and the way that you're going to do that is by doing this, and here's the formula, and here's how much it's going to cost you, Andy. And I'm going to get you, if you could tell me, Andy, how much your lifetime value of a customer is, $1,200, great. Then if I get you one customer, we're going to assume that it's $1,200 worth of, of revenue for Mile Walk Academy, great. And then how many people does it take you to get a customer? Great. And on and on and on. And then you put a pack together for me that says, Andy, if you want 1,000 more cu you know, customers a week, or a month, it's going to take 12,000 people because you only get one in 100 or whatever it is. Here we go. You're going to pay me, if I generate $2 million for you, you're going to pay me 200000 right kind of thing. And if you could walk me through that plan, then number one, I know you know what you're doing. Number two, I know you have some business savvy. Number three, I know you can see the big picture. Number four, at least even if you don't know the insides of my business, which I wouldn't expect you to do, you know the right questions to ask me, and so on and so forth. Right. Think in terms of what I need as the interviewer and as the business owner. All right. Once you could get in this mindset, that's it. That's your whole interview. You want to work for the Mile Walk Academy. How much money do you want to make? I'm happy to pay you. Tell me what you're going to do to justify that. And if we can't justify that initially, then you and I will work together on a path to get you to that number.
I'll tell you what $426,000 looks like at my company and what you would need to generate in order to do that, in order to, for me to want to, to, to wanna pay you that kind of thing. All right, now, you're gonna go into a company, you're gonna interview, and you're gonna, you're, gonna, you're gonna respond to questions that I have, right? How did you go about doing this? Tell me about that project. I see you worked for this other career coach, and you're telling me you were able to generate her a 1,000 leads a month, whatever it is, and I'm gonna ask you a question. I'm gonna give you the formula right now that I teach in my premium programs, and you might've heard me talk about it on YouTube, of the ultimate way that I think you should respond or tell stories in interviews to most interview questions. So first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about the formula. I'm gonna explain how the formula works to elicit the feelings you want them to have about you, and then we're gonna walk through an example together. So it's kinda like peeling, peeling the layers of the onion. So for those of you that are familiar with the Andy formula here, it looks like this. I call it my car technique, and I call it my car technique just because it's a cool acronym. It's actually, I wish I could call it what it really is, but you'll follow along. The first piece is the context. The second piece is the approach that you're going to take. Then there's a second pass through the approach with a bit more detail. And the third thing is the result and ultimately what happened. Hang on, we're gonna review this. We're gonna review this a few times. So the first thing is most people skip over the context. And what the context is, so some of you like the star technique. I don't know why, but you do. And the situation in the star technique is not that much unlike the context or the challenge or the problem or the really the C in 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 my technique. I don't I don't have a major issue with the S of the star as long as you number one don't pick the wrong situation and number two you actually don't flub it up because that's what most people do. Some people say, well the situation was my boss asked me to to solve this problem and then my activity was to put a spreadsheet together and yawn. Right, The context is what creates the drama because the context is what's going to give you heft. And the context is also going to do a number of other things to set the story up to capture their attention and keep it. We had this issue with our customer service platform. Our service was poor and we were losing 25% of our customers a year. That equated to $10 million. I was in the situation where I was hired as the chief operating officer to actually grow this company they had zero growth over the previous five years, right? Okay, they're flat. You're painting me a story and you're going to give me some color for me to understand that there's some drama here and that you have a level of importance that they, they, they counted on you to be able to pull this off. Okay, so this is, this is really, well, what was the big, big problem? But I want particular color about it and I'm gonna show you good color and I'm gonna show you bad color here in a minute. The second thing is you want to go through it in an approach format. Now, where the star technique really stinks is when it gets to the task. I don't want you to ever talk about a task. Why do we never want to talk about a task? Because a task is a simple little itty bitty thing. And people pay less for task-oriented people. They pay less for people who solve one little step. It's not the same. When I say to you, I've got a job search coaching program. I'm going to help you find yourself. I'm going to help you market yourself. I'm going to help you search. I'm going to help you crush the interview. I'm going to help you negotiate the heck out of it. And I'm also going to throw in a first 90 days thing so you crush your first three months. I'm going to do a whole bunch of other stuff, whether you're a career changer, an executive, uh, an emerging professional coming out of school, and this and that. There's a whole box. There's a whole system. You're going to pay more for that than you're going to pay for, well, I needed to fix this part of my resume because the career profile stunk, right? I'm going to pay a lot less. But what a lot of you do when you hit the second part of what you're saying is you're talking about a task. I don't want you to talk about a task. There is nothing in your life that you've ever done that's a task. Everything that you've ever done in your life is a formula. It's engineered. You are the center of the universe and everything that you do, especially when it comes to interview storytelling, happens around you.
There's a formula. Maybe there were some steps before. Maybe there was you. Maybe there's some steps after. Maybe you did all the steps. But everything can be reverse engineered into an approach. This is an outline, a playbook, a framebook, or whatever you want to call it. But it's a system that you're going to tell the interviewer you did, went through, built, or whatever. So you're going to give them your approach in terms of the steps. You're only going to give them the steps. Again, we'll go through an example. Then you're going to go back through your steps. Okay, step one, step two, step three, step four. Here's what I did. Okay, let's go to step one. Here's what step one entailed. Why do you want to do this? Well, number one, you've given them your playbook. Number two, you've given them an outline. You said to the listener, I'm going to take you through five steps. You're going to know where I am at all times. You'll know exactly where we are in the story. And for any of you that have a hard time concentrating in an interview, or maybe you say, hey, I'm a little too verbose, or maybe I get into the, to the weeds too much. You've got a built-in checklist in step number two that you're going to walk through and keep yourself on track and keep yourself moving swiftly through the story. You're going to do that with the activities that you're actually going to talk about within each of the engineered steps. Then you're going to get to the end and you're going to give them the result, which, if you've done this correctly, will echo the context you've told them because I just said, we had this customer problem, customer service problem. We were losing 25% of our customers. It was costing us $10 million. I'm guessing because you told me all that, you're going to tell me you fixed it. If not at least that, then some or some great portion of that, right? You're foreshadowing. Now you get to hit me with the goal and objective and the victory twice, all right? So far, so good. Hold on. We just went through the outline, but I'm telling you this for a reason, and I'm refreshing this with you for a reason. Because of this structure, you will inherently, even if you don't know what I'm, what you were doing, start sending the signals I want you to send them, and I'm going to explain to you what the feelings are that you will elicit in each stage of the story if you follow the formula. So the first thing is, let's go back to the context. Part one, it gives you heft. What does the context do? It sets up a feeling in the listener's mind that you must be important. Wow, that sounds like a big problem. Wow, you mu the fact that they enlisted you to do this must mean you have a know-how to run through a project of that size, whatever this is. Because I'm going to imagine if you fixed a 25% attrition problem and a $10 million loss that you must know what the hay you're doing. You might not know anything about customer service, but you might know a heck of a lot about building customer service systems that win, right? Oh, the pressure's on you. Handles pressure, grace under pressure. Oh, wow, I bet there was a whole lot of ambiguity that's associated with that. Whoa, what did you do? Whoa, you're quick on your feet, right? Do you, do you, do you, do you get this, right? You're immediately sending these signals. You're not even using any of these words, okay? This is the first thing. The second thing, is the approach. I mentioned the playbook, okay? I might use the word system, framework, playbook, whatever it is, outline. I use that all interchangeably, but ultimately what I mean is you know what the steps are. It says you're organized. Not only are you organized at work, you're organized in the way you tell a story, right? I've got the framework. I understand the big picture, and I know all the pieces that go in there. They're going to pay more for that. Now, if you've done this correctly, if you've done this correctly, between this and this, you're probably not even 30 seconds into the story. Okay? So just, just remember this. You've got seconds to capture and keep their attention. If you do these two things correctly, you could almost have gobbledygook coming out of your mouth for the next two and a half minutes, and you're still going to get hired. I'm not, kid I'm not kidding you. Once you got them up front, they're here, right? They're here. They're here. You got them if you do these two things correctly. Then what happens is you're just giving them a little bit of detail because you're now going to select and choose the details you share to illustrate what? that you have the working knowledge, that you know how to overcome the problems. Maybe you had some variables you were dealing with, and you're going to give them a little more inside the story that's going to, and here's what they're going to be doing. Yeah, yeah, sounds right. Yeah, yeah, sounds right. Yeah, yeah, that's what I would have expected. Maybe you surprise them along the way and you throw something in there that they didn't. Either which way, they're paying attention and you got them, assuming you're moving, you're moving along. And then when you get to the, when you get to the fourth step, 
and you're going to hit them with something of the great eight. I just gave you what the great eight were, right? Between revenue, generation, all the way down to process efficiency. You're showing them, I really understand the big picture. I am business savvy, right? I make major contributions, those kinds of things. And if you tell your stories this way, there is an undertone throughout all four stages of the explanation that you what? Have good communication skills. You're a go-getter. You're motivated. You give a good presentation, right? Do you, do, do you find this? This is the stuff that carries along all the way when you're telling a story. So between the context, the approach where you're giving them the steps, the approach part two where you're giving them a little bit of the activities, remember, for illustrative purposes only, you're, a lot of you are thinking about telling all, you know how you say, Andy, I can't get my resume down to two pages. You can't get an interview story down to three minutes either, right? I know that because you're trying to put all the details in there that do not sell you best. So I want you to start asking yourself, we're going to get to an example here in a second. I do not want you to try to explain everything well that happened. I scratch these so fast, people. I make mistakes too, you know? Okay, that happened. You don't need to do that. I want you to be thinking as you're piecing together the story, what feeling or requirement for the job, not your requirements, I'm talking about theirs, does this detail convey? Does it really matter? Does it really matter? And a lot of you get super bogged down with a lot of details. And you're number one, you're trying to stuff all the details. And number two, even worse, you're trying to remember them all. Right, you're trying to memorize your stories, which is which is a really bad way to go. Right, I want you to know your outlines or what I would call right the framework or the steps. You did this. You do this every day of your life. You should be able to remember the steps, or you should be able to jot them down in a reverse engineered format where you can recall them immediately. Okay, so wait. So now, now I want to get into an example to bring to basically bring this to life. You guys liking this so far? If you are, can you give me a little a little love on the on the on the YouTube like button? Maybe share this. People need help. Okay. I had to take a few notes because I wanted to make sure I got I got some of the details right because there's this woman I worked with a few months back. It was last year. And I really, I really liked her. And uh, I loved what she was doing for work. And she worked for a consumer good a food like a food company maybe among other things, and uh, was, in, was in Europe. And I want to read to you uh, kind of the background, it's only just a couple of words, on how she was thinking about um, one of her victories. Because as part of our, our coaching session, we look at what are the goals that the employer is going to have for anybody who's going to want to hire you, then what are the goals for this particular position, and what stories in your resume can we convert into great interview stories? Or basically, what, what experience do you have in your resume? Can we convert into great experience so that we can actually tell these stories in the job interview so they know you can help them achieve their goals? And she was a reasonably senior person. Um, but I think, if I remember correctly, she wasn't quite the strategist or the completely new innovator. Okay, so she was in product innovation, but she was more of what I would call kind of the quarterback and the driver of the project. So I don't want to say like a project manager, but basically she's managing a product creation and launch and introduction into the market. Okay, so what, what she said is, this was the bullet on the resume that we then turned into a story. But I want to I want to kind of bring you full, you know, kind of through the whole journey. Spearheaded Fiberjack's Big Ben innovation. Okay, so Fiberjack's like flapjacks, like pancakes. Um, a key project establishing foundation for Jack's platform. That's the product line of the pancakes. Um, by close collaboration with research and development and cross-functional team. Exceeding target sales by 45% with a 0.2% market share in year one. Now, I see what she was trying to do. Okay, but what happens from a contextual standpoint and a generation of feelings in me? So I don't, 
close collaboration with R&D, I don't really know what that means. F Cross-functional teams, I don't know who they are. Exceeding target sales by 45%, I don't know what your target was or what it should have been. I don't know how much money that is. I don't know what that is. I don't know how many sales that is, if it's two, if it's 100, 145, or whatever. And with a 0.2% num numerology, number psychology, 0.2 of anything, even trillions and trillions, is still a small number to me. So I don't really understand all that. So I started asking her questions. These are the questions I asked her, and here's how the story evolves. So I said, okay, tell me what this is. She said, well, we had this pancake product, like Flapjacks product, and it, we'd been selling it for a long time. And it, actually, I said, well, how much do you sell? And she said, 50 million. I think it was 50 million. I don't know if it was euros or dollars or whatever it was, but 50 million. And she said... And my job was I was in charge of a project where I was to think about a new way to market the product or create a new product line that was still in the same family of these pancakes, but that would appeal to the under 50 crowd. So the 50 million in sales was all to 50 and over demographic. So, so I said, okay, how much money do you generate in the, in the below 50 demographic? And she said, she says, oh, really nothing, like oh, zero, negligible. Let's call it zero. Okay, then I said, okay, don't take me through the story. What happened? Like this 0.2% of market, like how much money did you generate with your launch? She said 2.5 million. Okay, that sounds good, like a good number. But so wait a second. There was 50 million and you added 2.5 million. That doesn't sound like a lot. I'm not, we're not poo-pooing her accomplishment. I'm, all I care about is storytelling right now. What markets you best? Okay, that's reality, right. But also, zero to 2.5 million is reality. Okay, who's following me right now? Zero to 2.5 doesn't sound anything like 50 to 52.5, right? What does one sound like? A tweak. What does the other one sound like? Do you have any idea how hard it is to gain the first dollar of a new product line? Let me tell you from somebody who knows. It's excruciating. Okay. Then I said, hang on. Let's put this in the proper context. How much money did you get to do the project? She said, 200000 Okay, now the motor's running. Wait a minute. You had no sales. They gave you a paltry $200,000. You turned it into $2.5 million. Yeah. Okay, well, take me through the project. So well, I didn't do everything. It's like, take me through the project. What are the steps that you go through? I know nothing about product launch of innovation of pa uh, pancakes, okay? Take me through this. She said, okay, well, Andy, um, we do some market research. So, okay, it took us a little while to get to these seven steps. We do some market research. Then we, I have to determine the trends. Okay, customer insights. Okay, whatever that is. Explore solutions, confirm the path, implement it, and track it. Okay, sound sounds simple enough. Let's go back through this again. Market research. So if you're telling a story, you're going to zip through those seven steps, except when you set the context up, let's go with that first. You could say, well, I helped, we had this product line, and the context is, the situation is, I had to launch a new product because we weren't selling a lot to people in the younger demographic or under 50. You could say there was this, multi actually it's billions of dollars that people spend on pancake mix, right? There's a $2 billion industry of which we were getting zero for a primary demographic of people under 50. That's context, right? So I was put in charge and given a small budget of $200,000, a mere $200,000 to try to create a new product line that would open up our revenue in this particular demographic of which this multi-billion dollar industry, we were getting zero. That's context. Okay, then what? So in order to figure out what the new product line was going to look like or to remarket the existing product line, because there's multiple ways to do this, I had to go through seven steps where I had to do market research, evaluate the trends, get the insights in the customer demographic data. I then had to formulate some solutions Right, I had to confirm the path to try it, implement it, and then track it to see if it was working. There's the seven steps. There's the first line of the approach. Okay, so now we're going to go back to her stories. I said back to her story. I said, okay, tell me about the market. I said, well, okay, I had to look. I okay, market market analysis. 
So I had to go out. I had to look at what people were buying, different product lines, different products from different companies. I had to look at how much money was being spent. Boom, boom, boom. Got it. Go. Next step. Next step. Determine the trends. What, what were they buying? They were generally buying in the, in the under 50 crowd. They were generally buying certain things from certain places in certain locations. Great. I got it. Now what? Well, then I got the customer insights. I said, tell me about that. She says, well, I didn't actually do that. The Boston Consulting Group did that. BCG. I'm like That's detail we don't need. There were, did you evaluate the market trends? I did. Did you draw conclusions? I did. So wait, they all, you had a bunch of consultants running off, gathering data to give you that we didn't need to waste your time with? Great. You don't bog the story down with that. You say we went through, did the customer insights. In the customer insight, we grabbed data such as the demographics, the geographies, the ages, what they were buying, their preferences, this and that. Give me the details. Bang. Go on to the next step. I got it. She knows how to read reports. She knows how to generate reports. She knows what to look for. That's the feeling I need. There's no way I'm going to remember all that. So don't interrupt yourself as you're going through sending me the feeling and getting me to elicit the feelings you want me to, to do. Okay, you explored the solutions. What did that look like? So I drafted multiple opportunities of ways that we could penetrate the market. Great. Tell me what those were. It was this, 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 change the boxes, create a new chemical composition, and so on. It looked like, based on the customer, Customer insights that people in that demographic like the words fiber and protein because that's what they want in their diet. That's what they're appealing to. Great. Get those on the box. Right. Kind of thing. You're moving, 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 moving. They're like, yeah, okay, great, great, great. You got it. You read it. You did. Okay. What? All right. Then what? All right. I had to confirm the path. How did you, how'd you do that? Okay. I had to put a report together. Right, exactly, because you're not paying for this. you got to get your company to pay for this. So I had to put together a managerial presentation that I had to take to the board. It had everything in it from the data analysis that I went through to the conclusions I drew, to the recommendation I was going to give them, to the cost, to the benefits, to the risks. Great. Sounds like she knows what she's doing. Got all the ingredients in a management presentation. She obviously got them to sign off. She must know how to influence those people. Back to the story, right? This is what's happening with such little information that you're saying. Then what happened? So we put in my recommended approach. Management team approved it. We put in the approach. We generated two and a half million after the first year, right? You follow me? Do you know how long it takes to tell this story? Two minutes and 50 seconds. And all of a sudden, you're getting all the signals sent. They're feeling like, wow, she knows what she's doing. She's influential. She understands analysis. She's engineered. She knows what to look for. She knows how to evaluate the market. She knows how to, how to pick, choose, correct, uh, correctly choose, present it to management. What happened? We generated 2.5 million. That's a 1,250%. You can tidy up the math return on a $200,000 budget. That's a story. Do you guys see the difference? You could go into, it took me 17 weeks to gather the data. I had to get this. We had seven consultants working on the project. I got the report. Then I had to. Do you see, do you see the difference when you are pacing yourself? Here is what we were trying to do. We were trying to break into a market of which we had a product line, but we couldn't gain any of the of a major demographic that we knew would like our product. You follow me? All right. So there was seven steps I needed to take to launch the product. Here's what they were, right? Market research, whatever. Determine the trends, customer insight, yada, yada, yada. Okay. Then she goes back to the story, just like I mentioned. Then what happened? Zero to 2.5. I had a woman one time, a couple of, couple of women, in fact. One in, in, I don't know if she was in Asia Pack. She said, well, Andy, I, you know, we had this oil and gas, pro, you know, this product. And, well, you know, I, I, I sold like $100,000. Um, in, in, like, okay, well, what happened? Well, well, we had this product, you know, we're a multi-zillion dollar company. But we didn't have any any presence in like this coast on in Africa where we knew that there would be a lot of 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 opportunity. So wait, you went from zero to a hundred thousand. Those are the hardest dollars because now you have you have to get your brand recognized. You have to people have to know you're there. You have, that first dollar is the hardest.
right? It isn't, I, I did a $100,000 product of a $7 trillion oil company. No, there was nothing. They brought me in. That, that COO kind of illusion I made earlier. So, well, I, I increased it $17 million on a $50 million company. That sounds pretty good. Almost, what, 40%, not quite, 30 some on percent, 35%, 34%, give or take, right? Okay, that's one way to tell the story. Another way to tell the story is there was five years in a row they were stuck at 50 million. They didn't know what they were doing. And you came, and in one year, that happened. No market shifts you like that unless you know what you're doing. What did you do, right? But don't go into, I was brought in to help increase the revenue, and I did that. Well, no, because part of the context is for five years, they were struggling. Don't miss that. That needs to be said. You don't use 50 million when you make 2.5 million. You use zero when you make 2.5 million. Who's tracking? You guys get you get what I mean. So I want to recap these feelings for you. I want to recap them, right? Context gives you heft. Paint the picture the way you want to paint it that markets you best to show your impact. It's going to send the feelings of importance that you can solve and you're organized and can solve ambiguity. You know how to handle pressure. The approach, the playbook, they always pay more for a system. Give them and you a map in the storytelling where you're going to walk through the steps. There are the steps. You've heard the Andy organizes his closet fictitious semi-fictitious story, right? The clothes go out. They all go on the floor. I throw them in the piles, the shirts, the pants, the whatever. I prioritize them because there's criteria because it's spring. That means that the long sleeve shirts are going to go this way. The t-shirts are going to go that way. The shorts are going to get moved up. Great. Then I fold everything. Great. Then I put it back. I put it back one at a time. I start from the back of the closet and I move to the front of my closet. Ain't that big. You get the idea. Everything has a, a system this, you can move quickly, is a mere for illustrative purposes only. Illustr write that, for illustrative purposes only. Not all the details need to be said. What paints the story to elicit the feelings you want? What details do you need to include? You didn't need to include the fact that the boss consulting group gathered all that. We gathered the market data. The market data included this. I evaluated the parts that looked like that. Right? Yes, I know we, we, we. Right? Grade eight, show the result, and you know the entire time. This is what they're thinking. Great communication skills. Ask yourself, as you're piecing your stories together, what feelings or requirement does this detail convey? If it, if it elicits the right response, it goes in. If it doesn't, it goes out. And remember, um, it's all about the deltas. Zero to two point five, zero to a hundred thousand, right? It isn't. It is the incremental has to be put into context. It's not fifty to fifty two point five. It's zero to two point five. Okay. Hope you enjoyed that. Uh, if you did, please click the like button, share this. Make sure you subscribe to the station. If you're here with me live, we're going to the chat. If you're watching this on the recording, I'll see you next week. All right. I hope you enjoyed that. I keep trying to think of different ways to illustrate the same stuff to you guys. And it's a challenge. It's a challenge. But I hope you like this rendition of the car technique. Uh, speaking of interviewing, you know since April of 2018, been shipping this book everywhere in the world. Mere seven bucks. It pays for the envelope and the service, guys. I pay the shipping and everything else. I paid to manufacture this $28.95 book. For you, grab that. Couple other things. Uh, we got a mini camp, job search mini camp. Kara is has posted it. If you have not registered, if you have not registered, please do. It's April twenty second, twenty third, twenty fourth, and twenty twenty fifth. Okay, and on April twenty first, which is a Sunday. We are going to send you the follow-along workbook if you've, if you've bothered to register. If you don't bother to register, we won't send you that. And it is on YouTube, so there's no, no Zoomer room for this. You just come show up to the channel just like this. But there's a follow-along workbook. 
It's four full days. It's like it's well over 10 hours of stuff. It's it's going to be awesome. Uh, let's see my uh, well, let's continuing on on the job searching stuff. Uh, we we recently raised the prices of my job search coaching program. We did that back in March, in the middle of March. We have a self-study uh, package. We have an interactive service package, which is more communicative and more interactive, as the name implies. And we have a VIP package. It is my signature job searching product. I want you to know that we recently put it on special. Maybe Kara can swap the pin out or the, yeah the pin out um this page is the interactive service and vip packages i'll show you what those are in a second are 300 off through april um we do have the mini camp as i mentioned on the 22nd through the 25th the members of those of, of all of any of these packages is going to get priority on their q a i also have a linkedin workshop that is available to only these members april 30th may 1st and 2nd I'm going to be teaching you the profile, the platform, the networking. I've enlisted multiple recruiters, corporate and executive, to come in and talk with you. This is not free. This is only available to members of this program, which is $300 off. And then Andy AI, this is $199 per month that you do not have to pay because I give it to you gratis if you're in this program. It's a sweet deal. And much like I said in the package... Uh, it, it's, it's everything you could possibly imagine. It truly is. It covers all the upfront stuff. It covers the resume, the covers, the LinkedIn stuff. It covers the entire job search, interviewing, negotiation. You could look inside. That's a pretty new look inside video. There's a whole bunch of other stuff. And interactive service and VIP uh, members, we do year-round coaching. Every month we do coaching. Sometimes it's Q&A. Sometimes it's teaching in Q&A. We do it on Zoom uh, in April, April 30th. The next one uh, and, and May 1 and 2 is we're building a LinkedIn program that I'm going to drop in their library. It's really great. Andy AI, you know what? I, I really, I can't, I hope uh, for those boot campers who have access to Andy AI, let, the, let people know what your experience with it is. I, I cry when I get the emails from people about how much they love it. That's Andy all the time built from 11 million words of my teaching. It's my brain. It's my answers. And it'll pretty much do anything you want related to your career. So it's awesome. That's no waiting. So the self-study is always $9.97 now. The interactive service is usually $12.97. And the interactive service is what comes with the online support so you can ask me questions whenever you're going through, or you can ask Andy AI. Uh, Andy AI has really helped me reduce the number of inquiries I get because the Andy AI is so good, it's going to give you the answers real Andy would give you, generally speaking. So that is now $9.97. So if you've been sitting on the fence, it's a great thing to do. The VIP pack is now three grand. And you can get it for, I guess, $2,700. We do have additional, I do do one-on-one -on -one coaching to those members for an extra charge. It's really nice. Uh, we do have a trade-up program. So if you're in any of my existing programs, like the Resume Writing Workshop, the Job Search Challenge, the Interview Intervention Program, the Salary Negotiation work uh, Workshop, any of the mini camps, all those kind of things, we give you credit for anything you've paid on the job searching side. Email Kara at support at milewalk.com. If you want to know whether the product works, click the buttons on the page, and you can go to the case study page. There's videos of people talking. Most of them are about a half an hour to 35 or six minutes. There's some short testimonials. There's some short videos. This page goes on forever, uh, but you can check that out. Uh, we don't offer any returns because, well, it's all digital and I want you to be committed and the amount of time that I spend supporting you, I'm not giving your money back. So that's that. I'm confident it'll work. What else? The Zebra Code. My fourth book, we already started. The kickoff was last Monday. You can get the replay if you're not in the free book club. The lessons on focusing and self-awareness have already been released. So there's months and months of coaching, that leadership coaching that you can get for free. If you bother to pre-order the Zebra Code, you don't even pay for it till it ships in August. It's available right now in or for pre-order in hardcover 
and in ebook format. I recommend Amazon. Uh, that's what we're really monitoring. Although I really don't care where you pre-order it from. We have a, a book club page. You go in and drop your book order number, your name, your email, and you can join us in the private community for the Zebra Book Club. And all of you that are in the Zebra Book Club, you're going to get an email tomorrow from me, book club related, and you're going to get an email Monday because the self-awareness challenge officially starts Monday with the alerts we're running out of the community. I'm going to help you with the thought provokers and the first step in the challenge. I'm going to we do that every Monday. And uh, I would I would encourage you to check out check out the page. Uh, I think that's about it. Let's take some questions. Kara, how are we doing on the questions? Can you maybe help me here? Uh, Mohit, any storytelling specific tips for people interviewing for director level and executive positions that demonstrate the employer, your strategic thinking and experience of handling challenges? Okay, to, to, to just try to give you the delta of what I said today. Structurally, what I gave you today, that's what you need to do. When you're talking about the context, if you are not talking strategically and big picture, that's going to be a real problem. If you also, if you also do not understand how all the business units operate together, that's a problem. So you need to be able to demonstrate that. The other side of the coin where I think the executives really win is in the way you ask questions. The line of questioning, I'm talking about you asking them questions. The the level of you know research that you do, how astute your questions are, and most importantly, I cannot stress this enough, the multi-part line of questioning along the same subject line. Meaning, if you ask a question and they give you an answer and you move on to the next question, that's bad. That's puddle surfing, and that's demonstrating that as an executive, you don't know how to dig, meaning you, how, like, how are you going to evaluate and make critical decisions if you're going to ask a question and think you have all the information? So it's important to go back and forth and have follow-along questions and follow the forks down until you get to the, an area where you absolutely have, at least at that point, everything that you feel you can get. And if you're not doing that, if you're not doing that with me, I would know you're not for me, at least at that level. So those are some things I would highly, highly concentrate on. Um, boot, uh, let's see, Uzoma, how are you, buddy? How do we best tell a story in an interview when the percentages or figures might seem small or relatively insignificant compared to the company we might be interviewing to work with? Okay, the first thing is, I don't know what the numbers are and I don't know what they're in relation to. Now, if I remember correctly, you're in marketing and you have a particular forte around content and social. So, it, right, is that correct? So if, if that's the case, it isn't just, it, it could be, it could be. So let's just say, let's just say you came to Mile Walk and you increased my traffic and the demographic was a tighter relationship, meaning and I only increased, okay, so Andy gets a, a thousand leads a day and I only increased Andy's traffic a hundred, just 10%, 5%. Wait, no percent, zero. It, I still have a thousand, except that my conversion rate of those thousand, instead of thirty customers, is now fifty customers. Right? How my my message to you is: How can you, without having the data in front of me, how can you look at your metrics and shape the way I see the impact you've had? Because if you said to me, Andy. It, uh, you want more, like, I want more leads because I think I'm going to convert them. It, you say, well, how many do you convert? If I say three in a hundred, spend a thousand bucks with me. Yeah, but if you got me one more, one more, that's what? 33% increase off the three. 
That's an extra thousand a day. That's big. So what, what relationship am I looking for that paints the delta, the biggest delta? That's what I would be asking. Where can you find that? What's happening? Remember, remember what I say. When you're doing something, I want you laser, laser focused on the activity. But no benefit, zero, happens with the exception of your growth. No benefit happens when you do something. Right now, there's literally no benefit to what I'm doing. I'm getting to practice my communication skills and my live office hour skills, right, kind of thing, and answering questions. And I'm building a bank. There's a benefit of this. And the other benefit is what? Kara's going to take this little clip of me and Uzoma talking and the other 188 of you, and she's going to circulate it someday on social media. There's a benefit to that. Right. The benefit is in what happens after. The benefit isn't even her circulating it. The benefit is somebody seeing it and living a better life because of it, maybe buying a book from me, maybe what getting a coaching session or whatever. So there's a ripple effect and an impact on my business that I don't know until I see the echoes and the ripples. So you're always looking for the benefit beyond. Then it becomes, okay, once I can see the benefit, then in an interview how do, or in, on my resume, how do, I, how do I communicate that in a manner where I'm showing the relative impact or it could be absolute impact. So rel, relative impact on Flapjacks, the woman, the innovator, 2.5. So you're talking about a 5% increase. Okay, that, that's not the relative impact I want to show, right? 50 million to 52.5, that's a 5% increase. That's not the impact I want to show. Zero to 2.5 million is the, now I'm, now I'm in absolute dollars, but that's also not only an absolute illustration, it's a relative in, 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 in illustration, zero. Everybody knows the first dollar is the hardest to get kind of thing. So I'm constantly sweeping through stuff. This, I spend lots of time in interview coaching, doing this. I ask questions. We don't role play until I ask my questions because if I, I don't understand what the story needs to say, I can't effectively help you role play it or script it. So that's what I would do there. That's a great, that's a fantastic, fantastic question and a challenge. I, I know it is. Johnny Stevens, being laid off offshore. Okay, so your, your assignment is moving offshore in six months. You're getting seven, seven weeks severance if I stay the six months. Great support from the manager who was blindsided as well, I'm assuming. What is the timeline strategy for search? Do I wait? Can I negotiate offers using the severance? Johnny Stevens, you and I talk the same language, brother. Okay, I love this question because this is tricky. And I'm going to tell you the same thing I told my cousin Mary when the same thing happened to her and she called me all panicked. Had the kind of runway you have. I, it almost exact. Okay, all, literally almost exact. The, the exact scenario. And I said to her, Mary, I'm going to say to you, Johnny, right now, bang, I'm, I'm, I'm going. Boss hunting three a day, three a day, three a day. Right? Stay. Let the clock go. Let the clock go. You don't know. Be, you could be choosy. Then you could decide when you don't want to be as choosy. But I'm going full steam right now. If something comes, great. If not, you still got, you still got a little safety net. Now, now, with my cousin, I was also saying things to her like, you just got married. Actually, you're getting let go in April or May. Do you want to take the summer off? You guys have enough money. You don't have any kids yet. You have familial situation that's in your favor, right? You're in your 30s. You don't, right? Take time of your life. You'll never have this chance again kind of thing, right? I was saying things like that. I would say the same things to you and anybody else. Look at your situation. So six months from now looks like toward the end of the year, right? That's a really good time to be looking. Okay, that's not bad, but we don't know. I'm not a fortune teller. I can't predict the future. I mean, I like to say I could see around the corners, but I, I can't predict the future. And so I would not wait ever 
because what can I control? I can control my outreach. Some of these things might take longer. Okay, now you're going to say, okay, Andy, let's say I go, I start, and I get an opportunity in, I don't know, May. Okay, so it's April, May. And how do I evaluate? I wouldn't care about seven weeks of severance. Is this job going to pay me? And do I love it? And is this going to be a greater opportunity for me? I take it. Now, if we get down to November and you're getting an offer, then I'm negotiating either the start time, meaning can I stay the extra month so I can get my two weeks of pay and you you would just say you and but you don't talk you don't use the word severance ever you you what you are getting is a retention bonus i'm getting a retention but so totally sounds different it's the same thing it's still bucks right so if i stay until december i'm getting a bonus for two months of pay almost right kind of thing you tracking with me brother I know you are. That's a great question. That and then if like if it's if it's November and they're like, oh, we need you December first. Hurry up. You need to get a month in because in January we're doing this event. Blah blah blah. Then I would negotiate for that and say, can you give me an upfront? Can you give me some upfront payment? Maybe you don't have to pay me the equivalent to almost two months of my salary, but can you give me a month? Right to make make it a little more palatable. Everything's negotiable, but then it becomes a matter of being realistic. If you're doing that in May and you don't have this issue until December, I'm not going to make a big deal out of it. Then go ahead and stay there, right? If, as the employer might say. I love that. Retention bonus, Johnny. Retention. All of you that are getting severance because your company decided to outsource you or move your unit or, 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 or uh, divest your unit or whatever, and they are asking you to stay, that's not severance. That's a retention bonus. Just use the right words. Okay, I love it. Good luck, brother. All right. David Schwartz, how do you deal with the, oh, that role is in London, San Francisco, Seattle, so why should we talk to you? Uh, well, it depends. If you're going to say, I'm willing to move, then okay. I'm happy to talk to you. I, it doesn't matter to me where the role is. And if there's a possibility you think the role can be remote, I would just say I'm open to relocating, even if you're not. But if you want to get in there and go for it, right? And your your job, your job can be done anywhere. Yours can be. And so, I mean, I don't I don't know that, you know, assuming you're open to traveling and those kind of things. But uh, I I would just I don't say anything that would bounce me out of the opportunity ever. I want to, if they want, I want to go to, I want to go the distance. I want to get the offer and then I want to negotiate it then. And if at that point I'm unwilling to move to London, San Francisco or Seattle or wherever, then I, you just say, it's not enough money. It's not enough this or that. I'm not moving. If you can't come up with a better hybrid, I'm out. That's it. Reggie, how you doing, buddy? You are in the book club. I love it. Actually, we do need to start getting, we do need to start using the Zebra Club hashtags. Uh, will hiring managers automatically find and realize transferable skills from one context and applying them to the hiring process, or do I need to spell it out for them in detail? Reggie, I am not, I am not exaggerating for effect. That is one of the best questions I've been asked in months. Because, because this to me is one of the single greatest miscommunication issues that occur in interviews. I never prepped a candidate as part of Mile Walk's recruitment firm where I did not say to them as a final parting message, make sure you connect the dots for them in their environment. They will never be able to do it. And it's because, number one, everybody thinks their environment is the hardest. We have the craziest customers. We have the most convoluted product. Our product's so complicated, like, as, if it, as if no other companies is. And just because you were successful over there doesn't mean you're going to be successful over here. Yeah, I get that. But, okay, how could we start 
uh, and have more conversations in the future about how I would operate in your environment. So it, it like like this like this that CEO example I gave where the company couldn't grow. All right, well, every company wants to grow and every company has trouble growing. So if you want to make sure you're connecting the dots for them, you could say, so I was the COO, I was called in to do this and that, and this company was struggling. I unlocked it by addressing this, this, and this problem. What, what, do you, what, do you, what are your particular problems with your lack of growth? And I can help you understand how I would approach addressing those. Because at the end of the day, that company wants to grow its revenue, and that company wants to grow its revenue, as does every company. It's the problems they have that make it unique. So where you're connecting the dots is, here's how I've solved your problem, or here's how I would solve your problem. Or while I did it over here for this company that makes this widget, in your environment, it looks like this. And this is how I would do it here. You literally need to spoon feed them because interviewers are lazy. Remember, all they're, all they're doing, you're talking and you're telling them all this stuff. All they're doing is going, yeah, sounds like he could work in our environment. Yeah, sounds like he knows what he's doing. That's all they're retaining, right? I go, in th I go through all of this in the forgetting curve, right? And all the stuff that I talked to you about, about how, how quickly information and memory dissipates. Wait, not to mention your memory. Right. So so the, the answer is you need to be so specific and so explicit and you need to be constantly. And what 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 have I taught you, Reggie? It's if you're telling a story about if they ask you about something in your environment, they tell ask you something about your environment and you're telling them a story and you're telling them how you did something and you would have to do something differently in their environment. You need to stop, interrupt yourself in the middle of your story and say, well, this is how I handled it here, but, what, but in your situation, when I, when I would do it here, we would need to make this adjustment. Then hop back to your story, right? You fracture, right? Time, time, time frames, time zones. And, and so that helps connect the dots while you're talking about your history, but you're helping them see how you would operate in their environment. So this is, you need to spell it out for them or you need to make sure that they're seeing it. It's a big, big deal because I, again, tens of thousands of interview debriefs, clients would say to me, oh, you know, I, oh, this, you know, Reggie's story sounded good, but I'm just not sure he's going to fit here, right? What do you mean? Ah, oh, it was just a feeling I got, right? Except, except what, Ex right? Like, because you didn't talk about how he would do that. So you don't really know if he would do it that way. You don't know the raw material you're dealing with in your environment. Right, he's explaining how he did it in his environment. So this is the kind of stuff where you 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 need to you need to move that into their environment, into the future. And how, here's how I would handle it. All right, let me see. I'm a little over on time today, folks. Let me see if I could get some more of these in. Uh, Felicia. Boss hunted, got Zoom interview with head of re global real estate at end of day after waiting two months. Exec was late and was on the train. I'm sorry. Uh, didn't have my resume, but said he was impressed. Conversation was five minutes. He said he'll set up Zoom interviews with two division heads. How to follow up. Okay, the first thing is, I'm sorry that this happened. and But however... I'm glad you at least had an opportunity to talk to him for a few minutes. There's obviously some interest, even though it wasn't ideal. And if he said he'll set up the Zoom interviews with two division heads, I would send him a thank you email per standard protocol, and then I would wait. Now, it probably was rushed. It was maybe noisy in the background, and you can't go through the, what's the next step? I know I need to talk to the division heads. By when that going to happen? When will I hear from you? Kind of thing. And so I would give him a week or so, I would send him an email right away. Thank you. Please let me know. I'm happy to accommodate. And then I probably would have said, here's my availability. Right? I would have given him all that in my thank you email. And then if I don't hear from... Now, you, what you didn't tell me is if he said, you know, I'll, you know, we should get back to you by the end of the week, or I don't know how long this was, I'd wait a week or two. I'd send him a message and just say, want I want to follow up on this. I'm interested... Have you had a chance to talk to your division heads or whatever? That's it.
Stephen Carollo, Andy advises to work from the calendar, not a to-do list. That is true. But things to do constantly arise. I call them shrapnel. Where does Andy record those items before they are scheduled? Which section of the best self-planner? No section of the best self-planner. Okay, wait. This here... Okay, wait. Well, this is, this is, the, this is the mini camp gold. This here is my best self co-planner. It's, it's not the journal, it's a planner, meaning it has a calendar, it has a week at a glance, and then I use these two open pages, and anybody who's been through Andy's productivity training knows there's three columns on this side that inventory uh, activities for the week, not the day, that need to occur this week, then activities that need to occur that I need to move along because they're coming up the following week, the week after, the week after. So like this week, I'm working on stuff for the mini camp that's not going to be, we're not going to run that for three weeks or two and a half weeks or whatever it is, right? But I'm, I need to move things along. And then there's a third column of all the things I do all the time, writing you emails, uh, your newsletters, my podcasts, the coaching sessions I have, any resume reviews, things of that nature, people I need to schedule for interviews or meet with Kara to talk about scheduling or whatever it is. As I'm, as I'm going through my day, so in the middle of, of the day, or sorry, in the middle of the morning, I was writing an email to the book club members that I'm going to send tomorrow. So people that are in the Zebra Book Club are going to get an email tomorrow from me. I happen to be writing that today because it was something that I decided yesterday I wanted to give them something on Friday in particular. While I was writing that, I was only writing that, but up popped a few things in my head. And so on this paper, this is a, a different booklet or my notepad or whatever, or this thing here that sits, right? I will just write the note. And I won't revisit that until my writing block was over. So I completed their email. I packaged it up. I gave it to Kara. I'm set. She's going to draft it, put it in a system, draft it for us, and I'm going to review it later. Now, I transitioned to something else, like feeding the dogs. But I'm not going to actually look at my shrapnel unless I need to actually tell Kara something, do something with it or inventory it here, or just at the end of the day, review everything that came up. That could be phone calls. My phone's on silent, but I, I know I will have messages of people who tried to reach me while I was on live office hours. That doesn't mean I'm going to go race and call them back. I'm just going to make a note on the list that I need to call them back, and then I need to decide when that occurs, but I'm not going to do that now. So as I go through the day, I never let my mind try to hang on to anything I try to have all my resources up here available to completely focus on what I'm doing at any moment in time. And so what will happen is, is, is what came up something that needs to be planned for? Does it need to go in one of the three columns? Does it need to go tomorrow? Do I need to do it Saturday or Sunday? Does it have to be ready for Monday? So I Now, the other thing that you can do, you see these, Stephen, you see these ribbons? You got the ribbons. You could put one of the ribbons in the back. And you could use the back of the planner. This is another thing I used to do where I'd have shrapnel in the back pages because there's a bunch of dotted pages. But the reason that I like these pads or I like my, my regular notepad is it's right there. I just write in it, boom, it's kick it to the side. And that's it. And then I don't have to worry about flipping or whatever. So that's how I do that. Uh, Elma, oh, Andy, where did I get the massive mug you're drinking from? This was probably this was one of the races I did a while back in uh, for one of the Ironman races. I think this year, this year because the book is coming out, and I didn't, I didn't want to commit to any big races. I'll do some like you know Olympic triathlons or something like that. But I think I'll just do like individual events for all the Ironman events. Like so, I'll do a two point four mile swim in a lake or river or something i'll do a century bike ride it won't be 112 but it'll be 100 miles or whatever and then maybe i'll run a marathon at the toward the end of the year i i, I need my time to be free to do all the book stuff and all the publicity that's going to actually be starting soon so it's a little it's a little tall task to take on but i i get all my workouts in so it's like i could do those individual well i, I need to train for a little bit for the marathon but the other two i could just i could roll out of bed and do those <laughs> all right yavor how do you apply the car framework to a behavioral type of question? Tell me about a time. Yavor, tell me about a time you had a raging success. 
Yavor, tell me about a time when you overcame a challenge. Yavor, tell me about. Tell me about immediately puts you into a position to think about a story that you're going to tell. It leaves you to your own devices. So let's just say, let's just say that example I gave you of the flapjacks. Okay, I gave you a whole car technique of the flapjack story. Let's just say I sit down with you and I say to that woman, please tell me about a raging success. Please tell me about your strengths. Please tell me about this and that. There was this time I was asked to expand a product line for pancakes. The situation was, right? You go right into it. There you go. Whole car technique. So it's just a matter of you're being asked something. How did you overcome this problem? There was this time where we had this problem where we were unable to break into this market. Great. Tell me about a time you influenced somebody. There was this time I was asked to expand a product line because we had these we had this demographic that wasn't purchasing our flapjacks. As I went through the process that I'm about to explain to you, I had to convince the management team to go with my alternative. I could take any behavioral question and tell you that exact story I gave you in the example. Do you guys do you guys get this? I do not I do not train myself as a job candidate to answer behavioral interview questions. I train myself to have story a story or stories ready to help to help the employer accomplish this. I don't care what question you ask me, Mr. Employer, you're getting that story. Do you guys see that? I've, I've showed you this. Don't think in terms of how do I answer that question. What is it they need me to accomplish? What are the stories I have in my arsenal that will illustrate that? You can ask me any question. Tell me about a failure. I, I'll, I'll pick a failure inside of that story. You follow me? Do you guys get this? Kara, you know what? For the life of me, I cannot remember the video that we just pumped out about the way to, the way to prepare for a job interview. And Kara, if you can figure that out and, and post that in, I have, I, have, I have a whole video dedicated to this about how to prepare this way. But Yavor, do you, do you, see, do, do you see the difference Right? That is a great question. But I'm not I'm not preparing for questions. I'm preparing for selling me based on what they need to know, whether they ask it that way or not, because they're not smart oftentimes they're not smart enough to ask me that. Cause it, here, Yavor, I need you to come in and build me a cloud based, security based, this, that, and the other thing for my SaaS company. Can you just tell me how you do that? That's my interview with you. And by the way, tell me how much you want to get paid so we can figure out the <laughs> right kind of thing. I'm not worried about what question you ask me. I'm worried about the my story I'm going to tell you. I, I mean, I'm, I'm all locked in on what I'm going to tell you. You're getting that story whether you like it or not. Because that's the story you need to hear as your company, as your interviewer, as whatever. And then I might alter the way the story is either told or the pieces of detail. Like if somebody, if I'm interviewing with somebody who is going to be my boss and they're hyper sensitive to my persuasion skills, then I'm going to spend a little more time on how I pitch the board on this solution, right? Kind of thing. This is really good. How, to, ah, Kara got it. Can we, can we all give Kara a huge shout out? Five steps to prepare for any job interview, but wait. I'm going to compliment Kara here. Wait, sorry. I'm going to compliment her with an I and I'm going to compliment her with an E because that's a great one. And the other video that you should watch because it'll really help you focus on the end in mind is I had to write this down. Five ways to get paid more salary when interviewing. Kara, can you maybe give them that one too? Five ways to get paid more salary when interviewing because these are these talk about the five variables. The five variables you want to focus on when you're in an interviewing process are the five levers that they use to hire you and what they determine what they use to determine how much you're going to get paid. Whether they know this or not, I'm telling you this is true. They have goals in mind. 
They have problems to overcome those goals. So you need to know what the goals are, which is pretty easy to find out. The problems, you might have to you speculate first, then you ask why you're in the interview. The next thing is the solution. The solution is Andy wants 100 extra leads a day. Andy thinks the solution is more videos. Uh, I don't know, better, better copywriting on his social text. I don't know, what do I know, right? Okay, you might come in and change the solution. Andy, you don't need to do that. You don't need to make more videos. Your video, you have enough. You actually need to replay the one, whatever, whatever. There's a different solution. Then they have a profile in mind of what the person looks like about five years of experience using these kind of tools and this and that. That can change. And what that person costs in their mind. And you have the entire interviewing process to change those five variables to work in your favor. That video, five ways to get paid more salary when interviewing or something like that, I tell you, I tell you about those and, and how to manipulate those. So that's a good, that's a good, um, that's a good one. That's a good one. Five ways to get paid more in a in a, in a job interview or get paid more in a job interview, something like that. Yeah, that's great. That's great stuff. All right, folks, listen. I would love to go all day with you, but the, okay, things I want to mention. The mini camp is free. Make sure to sign up. The book clubbers, you're going to get a message tomorrow. Challenge starts Monday, and the book club is free. Just if you want to know about the book club, head to the Mile Walk Academy. It's right at the top. Click it. It'll take you to the page. It's a lot of free coaching over the, throughout the whole summer before the book comes out. It's, it's a great fun. We had a great time on Monday when we met. Uh, job search coaching programs, the boot camp is on sale 300 off the interactive service and the VIP packages. So it's it's it drops that price a good amount, uh, makes it a little more palatable. I, I'm not saying it's a cheap program, but it's highly valuable. It really will save you a lot of, of time and money and e e effort and pain. It really will. And then what else? I think I think that was about it. The LinkedIn um the LinkedIn workshop is going to be available to job search coaching program members. We're going to do that April 30th through May 5th. And don't forget, for seven bucks, you can have a little beauty. And uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this. You know how much I love these sessions. I love you all. Sorry if I didn't get to your question. Uh, if you, if you, uh, if you're always welcome to go to my YouTube channel, if you're, if you uh, are, are working with me on the, on the freemiums and drop your, your questions in, I do answer comments every day. Uh, I, I try to get to as many as I can. There's no guarantee that I can. Or if you're in the premium program and I didn't get to your question, you, you might have access to Andy AI or to real Andy in the, in the comments section. All right. Love y'all. I will ha Everybody have a great weekend. I know it's only Thursday, but a lot of you are probably sliding in the weekend already, hopefully. And then I'll see some of you in your inbox tomorrow. I'll see a bunch of you in your inbox on Sunday. And we got some good stuff coming up throughout all of April. On Sunday, I'm going to send a message to everybody in my on my newsletter about all the things we have going on April and all the insider stuff that you might want to be aware of. All right. Thank you all. Give Kara a big shout out. Love you lots. See you soon.